It's a great pleasure for me and a big honor for me that you come here to listen to me because and you probably are not interested in my person, but probably are also interested in, in ecological problems of Ukraine. And uh, I hope today I see a lot of my friends, I see a lot of colleagues, and uh, we also can, after my speech, we can together discuss how can we help our uh, nature yeah, yeah, to solve... Um... Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's much better. <laughs> Sorry. So I hope it was um, quite understandable before, but much uh, better now. So uh, I hope we also can have opportunity after my speech to discuss some problems with you and probably also can contribute and maybe it can be a start a new project that we can also uh, organize together. So um, unfortunately the topic that I'm going to discuss with you is not so, um, so happy and so good reason to, um, to assemble all the people, but uh, as a representative of the academic community, I think that the main idea of us to um, create this consciousness of what is going on in Ukraine, in Ukraine because it's, it affects not only Ukraine, but it affects all countries around the world, and we should understand, and we should be conscious of what is going on, and how, can, how each of us can help, can contribute. So for more than 600 days, People of Ukraine have shown um, the world a great example of bravery by successfully pushing back against aggressor. And with broad international support, Ukraine now is set to take over the aggressor and regain its territorial integrity. Yes, the war hasn't been finished yet. We all understand that uh, the war will cause a lot of other environmental and not only environmental but uh, humanitarian problems. But we have to start this dialogue. We have to start and think how can we help? How can we assess environmental damages? Because even the big, even the long term, uh, even the long uh, battle lies ahead of Ukraine. The battle for food security, the battle for green recovery. And now our idea to start assessing environmental damages, to create a plan, how can we rebuild, how can we revitalize our nature? How can how each of us, his experience, his knowledge can contribute to this big issue? And one, so uh, today I'm going to discuss with you what does it mean I can see the thing about, uh, we will discuss air pollution, oh sorry, air pollution, uh, water pollution, soil pollution, how can we apply for operation for a uh, natural disaster? And um, of course, one can argue, how can we? So the nature is not the first that we should discuss with when uh, the war comes, because it brings a lot of human casualties, a lot of crimes committed by Russia. And just scrutinize these numbers. It's a terrible numbers, and they will be engraved in our nationality for years, for dozens of years. But um, we all should think about our future. And environmental pollution, environmental damages will affect our nationality not for decades of years, but for several generations and for several hundreds of years. We will feel all the consequences of the war. So, of course, these uh, numbers are terrible. But take a look at uh, what is going on now in uh, the world and how the world react on a side. So, um, environmental damage caused by war uh, is a very urgent topic now. It's never, it's never been so urgent because now we uh, can witness a lot of war crimes against nature. And uh, criminalization of a society to international law is a very urgent topic. And uh, now it's under a big discussion. How can we involve, how can we detect what does it mean a society? And the to this topic should be included in, even in it's uh, under consideration now how can we include this topic in new European directive. And the Roman Institute 
author should be supplemented with uh, this uh, crime as a fifth crime. Uh, the criminalization of protected is a very important topic that uh, we all should be aware of. Because of uh, ecocide committed in Ukraine, it's not the first example. Before in our history, we had a lot of such terrible examples. For example, um, in Belgium, uh, soils near press still contains a lot of cuprum. About uh, 2,000 um, tons of cuprum after the First World War. Uh, territories of Iran contains thousands of mercury and chlorine after the Iranian revolution. Uh, territories of um, Chechnya contains uh, territories of Chechnya contains a lot of heavy metals and about 30% of our land were deemed as unsuitable for agriculture after first and second Chechnya war. Uh, in us uh, in uh, France after the first world war, one thousand. 200 square kilometers of the area were uh, deemed as unsuitable not for agriculture but for lives even. So uh, then it was created like so called rural zone, and only now, year by year, they sometimes withdraw some parts of this territory. Uh, but every year they found the authority of France, they found about uh, nine hundreds of metal straps and other ammunition that appeared on the territory. So it's still unsafe for human life. And uh, now it's, everybody uh, talks about the situation in Israel and Palestine. It also will cause a lot of environmental damages. And after the um, invasion in um, uh, 2089, about 70% of um, Gaza Strip was deemed as um, unsuitable for agriculture because of huge pollution caused by um, heavy metals. And now take a look at these numbers that occurred after 500 days of the war in Ukraine. And uh, it's not only numbers, it's something that will affect our health. It's something that um, we will feel, not only we, not only our generation, the next generation will be affected by these numbers. And uh, all of that will bring, will bring uh, deterioration of human health and um, will cause premature death rate, increase of premature death rate in future. And now it is a deal of great importance to collect all this data, precisely collect, assess, in order to make it public in the future, and in order, in order to understand the scale of the problem and how can we fight it. So I would say that government of Ukraine and um, civil society, in a very quick way, deployed system of fixation and recording of all environmental damage. So uh, almost immediately after the war start, Ukraine created operational headquarters of the state environmental inspectorate. Now uh, they have about 70 employees around the world who assess adequately all the cases of environmental damage. And also they have hundreds of inspectors in Ukraine, they um, they go whenever the incident, they know the, about the uh, cases of environmental pollutions and they go there. If it is not possible, they uh, try to get information from concerned people that is possible with uh, Echo Grid chatbot. So it's special digital program that uh, was developed, devised by um, our Ministry of Environment Protection together with Ministry of Digitalization. 
and uh, you can see the special app and already about uh, 18,000 18, people have joined this, uh, this uh, program. So they can send information with coordinates, with photo, with video recorded crimes against nature. And with all this information is collected in a special chatbot and but if this information is public, so you can um, come into this site, like a browser, and you can uh, check all the information about each cities. Uh, we have several, about more than 700 monitoring sites. And we also collect information from this app, from uh, inspectors. And uh, so it's all this information will be needed uh, for the future applying for operation. So applying to international part. So, um, and I would say that our non-government organization <coughs> have shown a very proactive position, and sometimes they're even more active than, than some government and research organization because of probably because of the archaic system, not they're not so flexible. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of organizations that shown, uh, have shown. A great example of um, uh, bravery. They uh, they go even sometimes on occupied territory. They take the cell samples from water, so sometimes even taking a risk of their health, their uh, lives. But they do that to show the people what is going on in Ukraine. They are very proactive. They're trying to uh, make it public, not only in Ukraine, all this information, but around the world. And uh, also, some uh, foreign organization also joined it. How uh, was this uh, ecological fight, for example, a conflict in an environmental observatory from the UK, uh, ZOI, environmental network um, from Switzerland, from Geneva, and, um, and they um, uh, provide some briefings, release briefings, where they assess damage for water resources, for soils, for um, about air pollution and so on. And also a uh, um, member of United Nations Environmental Working Group, humanitarian response that also we have constant meetings where about we are, we are about a team of 70, um, 70 people, 70 ecologists who um who has who is specialized in different topics of environment protection. And we together discuss problems, how can we help our government to solve it, how can we find decision, how can we involve our international partners to solve these problems, and so find the one. So uh, now let's talk about damages numbers. Uh, um, I gave you especially here some comparison with other countries for you to understand the scale of the problems because probably not of you are from Ukraine and not to you understand how big the territory of Ukraine is. So I can you imagine that 44% of Ukraine's natural conservation areas now are occupied on conflict zones. So it's like comparing to the territory of Israel. About 150 million tons of carbon dioxide have been already released into the atmosphere. So it's like, it can be compared with the normal release of um, such countries, Belgium, and you release such country of Belgium, just because of the war. And 3 million hectares have been damaged or burned. 3 million hectares of variable lands of Ukraine. It's like a two thirds of Switzerland. And um, territory of Ukraine is about 600,000 kilometers. And 250,000 now are mined. It's like a territory of Great Britain. Can you imagine the ter all the territory of Great Britain is mined? So, of course, it's terrible. And uh, from February 24, uh, more than 400,000 explosives have been neutralized in the territory of Ukraine. It's just 1,000 clear kilometers and still 176,000 kilometers, uh, square kilometers still need 
demining. And uh, uh, researchers and experts they say that it will take not less than 10 years to demine all the territory. And I am a mother of two children, I understand that next 10 years, when we get back to Ukraine, probably uh, I will not take risk to let my children go to the forest to get the mushrooms together, to just to have fun. It's terrible. And we have a special app developed for people, uh, for civilians. Uh, and here you can find the turtles. They have already been demined. And uh, where some miners have been detected. Of course, it, it doesn't cover all the territory and it's still uh, dangerous to go the forest where the active battles, uh, active fights uh, took place. But at least we have this app. And you know that Ukraine is quite a digitalized country. So that is why we have all this app where you can, all the information uh, can be accessible for public. And um, now we um, all understand that um, even before the war in Ukraine, we have a lot of problems, environmental problems that were not properly addressed. Uh, it's like if compared to now, I can compare the situation in Ukraine like with the body that um, had, uh, had an illness, disease. It was infected, drastically infected, and then after all what is going on now, it was uh, doubly infected, you know, I'd say. And now instead of to be properly treated, we have to solve all these bad consequences of the war. So, uh, but we understand, we all understand that all what is going on now in Ukraine is not our only our local problems, because it's problems that will be touched all countries around the world, especially our neighboring countries. Because um, for the young, uh, to the neighboring countries, rivers, they flows into their neighboring countries and windows, winds they blow whenever they want. And aquifers, they are connected underground. And here is the best we ever need. So, uh, and our neighboring countries, they have already understood that they also will have this environmental problem. So there's not a scale as we have, but still. And uh, our ministry have already assessed that damages caused by environmental pollution are totally in 25 million euros of environmental damage. So, and all the countries, they also will feel this will feel this um, bad effects. And I know that my colleagues from Cambridge University, uh, from the Department of Geospatial Analysis, they have already conducted some um, analysis of uh, soil close to the uh, western part of Ukraine, um, and they have already detected the increased level of radioactive substances. And they're going to come to Ukraine, especially to Kherson, to take the soil samples additional to understand, because you know, especially in the eastern and southern part of Ukraine, our armed forces, they use um, the play, uh, a weapon is the uranium. And we know that uranium um, radioactive elements that can cause cancer, bones, um, and uh, lungs, and a lot of um, components of our body. So the cross-border environmental impact affects number of countries. And I'd like just to give you uh, an example, probably one since that, okay, Switzerland is so far, but you know what the uh, when the accident in Chernobyl nuclear power station happened, the high concentration of radioactive elements were recorded um, uh, in the foothill of Swiss Alps. It was even higher 
this concentration of upwind sites and regions of uh, Ukraine. So because of wind, so Switzerland also was drastically affected by uh, accident in Chernobyl nuclear power station. And uh, our president has said during the last COP27 that without peace, uh, it's impossible, uh, effective uh, policy is impossible. And uh, here I compared some um, emissions of uh, different countries. And you can see that emission caused by one can be compared with normal emissions of uh, Belgium. And even before the war, Ukraine has a lot of problems connected with that it was warmed up up to 1.16%. And we didn't have a bright perspective for the next 30 years. It was forecast that probably uh, during the next 30 years, the temperature will be increased up to three degrees centigrade. And also prevent us from um, all the efforts that we uh, had done before the war uh, to stop climate change, to hold the swarming. So, um, we also understand that uh, the war uh, prevented us from uh, our commitment. Because before the war, uh, we did a lot actually. Uh, for climate policy. I was a member of uh, the, the group under the Ministry of Environment Protection, and we developed a strategy of ecological safety and adaptation to climate change. It was a good strategy. And we were in the process of developing exact plan, execution plan for the strategy. And uh, the, uh, the summer before the war, the uh, second national determinate impact uh, to the Paris Agreement was developed and adopted by our government. Uh, our president and prime ministers, they um, announced our commitment, Ukraine's commitment to Green Deal. And uh, Green Fund, uh, it, was, uh, it was laid foundation to, uh, foundation to create a green, uh, green Fund that could finance uh, such big projects, environmental projects, and um, major scale environmental project. So it also was a good step towards um, mitigation of climate, uh, climate changes. But now all these financial resources flows were redirected to military issues. It's not only in Ukraine, even other countries in the world, the same situation we see. Because these countries, to try to direct and to, to Secure to this this financial cost to security, to defense, to energy stability, and some countries, some the, even the rest use their energy police policy. Uh, they um uh, get back to um, coal fired uh, and uh, um, energy generation in order to decrease. Uh, price for their population, energy price for their population. So here you can see a contribution of each sector to um, the carbon emission, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission. And uh, for just one year, greenhouse gas emission, additionally, to normal emission, like regular, not normal, regular emission of our country, it was totaled up to 119 million tons. And um, one can think that probably when the war comes to country, the um, emission should should be decreased, but not because, because of um, economic crisis, because, of, yes, in Ukraine, uh, because of blackouts, energy shortages, shortages um, I would say that uh, Ukraine's economy um, contract, uh, contracted to up to 30% of 
compared to the for the war situation. But it doesn't mean that um, it doesn't mean that uh, the situation caused decrease in emission. Why? Just because. Um, oh, sorry, picture missed. Uh, just because people. Uh, that had to leave their country, they had to flee country, they took that footprint with them to other European countries. And um, and you know this law about available niche? So because of um, this uh, shortages, energy shortages, uh, because some of our manufacturers' fabrics, they were closed. And it also iron and um, other productions, they were just replaced in the other countries. And um, in some countries, we have already, they have already fixed the increase in, in carbon emission. Uh, and uh, of course, we have a, a huge problem with fires. Can you imagine that just uh, the last year, uh, the amount of fires increased uh, in 36 fold. And um, at the beginning of the war, we had a huge problem because our Chernobyl zone was on fire. Three months it was occupied. It was, and we didn't have access even to the zone to extinguish the fires. Um, but um, our civil society, they also developed this app that can show you in real, uh, uh, in real what is going on now in Ukraine, where we have fires. And uh, one day, March 22, uh, it was recorded about 6,000 uh, fires. The scale more than one hectare. So we easily can say that, the, that Ukraine was on fire. And all these fires, of course, they contribute to uh, increase of greenhouse gas emissions. And another problem, that contribute to greenhouse emission as uh, uh, refineries. Refineries, oil refineries, all the, the, all the time were main targets of Russian armed forces because they supply our army, our troops, uh, troops with fuels. And uh, since the beginning of the war, about uh, seven, 100,000 tons of oil products were burned because they were a target of drone attack, missile attack, and so on. And all this oil was burned, and all can you imagine the scale of uh, carbon gas emission? And the biggest, um, the biggest fire, the biggest destruction happened not so far in September when the biggest refinery station in Ukraine. Kremenchuk uh, was fired. And uh, uh, the capacity of this refinery station was about 18.5 million tons of uh, fuels. You can you imagine? The uh, amount of financial losses was about more than, one, uh, more than 11 million dollars. The um, amount of financial uh, amount of environmental losses still uh, have been assessed. And um, the third big problem, the third big contributor to greenhouse gas emission increase, it's, um, it's movement, movement of military techniques. Um, so, um, all that equipment, military equipment, like armored um, uh, personal carriers, military aircraft, tanks, they move from of, uh, European and American aid, they move from Western part to Eastern part of Ukraine. And um, just I would like to give you an example. One tank use about 500 liters of oil per, one, per 100 kilometers. And now we have got in Ukraine about 1,000 tons. 
the amount of tons of Russia is several times more. So you can imagine this kind of emission that we have. And uh, additionally to movement of this uh, military equipment, we have movement of um, private cars, buses with refugees that are moving from western part to eastern, from central part to somewhere abroad. And also tons of uh, humanitarian aid that comes from European countries that also bring this carbon emission to us. And by the way, uh, also by the situation in Ukraine, and that uh, reinforced uh, the norm that military should publish the greenhouse gas emissions data, and uh, they develop special methodologies. But of course, no one expects that Russia is a barbarian country to a uh, record on the greenhouse gas emissions. And it's quite difficult even for us to calculate this because the equipment that we I've got from uh, this kind of aid. It was developed 40, 50 years ago. It doesn't have any emission control to understand the scale of the disaster. So, uh, but it's a good step done by NETA to uh, at least to calculate greenhouse gas emission because it has never been done before. But actually, experts say that a military contribution to greenhouse gas emission totally about 5.5% of all greenhouse emission comes from military forces. So, and, um, as of, uh, as of 1st October 2023, Russia fired about 5,000 missiles into Ukraine. And the biggest attack was committed in September. It was about Six, more than 600 missile attack. Um, and all Ukraine was covered with this disaster. Um, uh, each missile contained uh, liquid or solid uh, fuel. And this fuel, um, for a long period of time, can contaminate our soils. And uh, solid fuel, it's not so dangerous as liquid, but uh, from other point of view, it can, it's difficult to stop combustion of solid fuels. And it brings a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emission to our atmosphere. But understanding the content of this missile, understand the content of this fossil fuel, it, it helps us to predict the scale of the disaster. And um, here you can see slides that I missed about the amount of refugees. And can you imagine that all these refugees, they didn't uh, go on foot, they took cars, buses, and so on. Can you imagine the scale of um, uh, emission caused by cars, this transport? And also, it should be noticed that the beautiful is to see with some bonds provided by Western countries, um, uh, there are uh, road from a very important uh, market road from Asia to uh, Europe. Uh, we are broken, and now this additional contribution caused by um, detour on the road of these um, aircrafts. Uh, it caused in total increase in gas emission up to 12 million tons of carbon dioxide. So it's like additional um, roads that were developed especially to uh, turn around um, territories that are banned by international law and cannot be crossed by air. And of course, the uh, terrible situation now is going on in the country. It's my uh, next topic, but, uh, but before, the, before this, I would like to say that now it's a great importance for Ukraine, and not only for Ukraine, for European countries to develop this uh, kind of energy policy, new energy policy, because now we have to think what will we do with our energy capacity after 
comfortable and because now about uh, two third of our energy capacities, energy generation here are allocated on occupied territories, destroyed or damaged. And even if we could have enough capacity, about half of our uh, power grid substation out of operation because of constant missile attack. And it's now it's time, it can be the, um, the good time to develop a new strategy. And together with my colleagues from HH Climate Policy Lab and uh, Imperial College of Berlin and uh, of uh, London and uh, Free College, Free University of Berlin, we develop a strategy uh, that uh, will help to assume the potential of uh, Ukraine to switch to renewables. So now we um, kind of uh, create these um, two scenarios. Uh, the first one is uh, when we um, when we uh, predict that our energy system will include uh, nuclear power stations, nuclear power share, and renewables, but uh, we will constantly refuse coal generation and gas reliance. And the second scenario, it's uh, just renewables. And now we are trying to analyze um, how can we make Ukraine carbon neutral uh, up to 2060. Why 2060? Because it was uh, announced by our uh, nas second national determined contribution. Uh, so now uh, we, are, we, are, um, we are using uh, different models to understand the, um, um, to analyze the sensitivity, the cost, uh, the cost difference to the input parameters using global sensitivity model to predict uh, the cost of different, to, to the different scenarios of energy developing the energy system in Ukraine. And the uh, second big problem is agriculture. Before the war, about 400 uh, million people worldwide relied on uh, Ukraine for their food supply. Ukraine was one of the biggest supplier of uh, oil, sunflower, uh, sunflower oil, the third exporter of corn, the fifth exporter of wheat. And of course, the situation in Ukraine has already caused big problem, not only in Ukraine, this food supply, but uh, around the world. And um, just take a look at these uh, numbers to understand how important agriculture is for Ukraine. Uh, as ecologist, I cannot say that it's a good, but uh, before the war, about up to 55% of Ukraine's land were arrival. Before the war, uh, agriculture, um, contribute, agriculture sector together with processing contributed up to 20% of our GDP. And uh, agriculture provided up to 30% of uh, Ukraine's population with employment places. And uh, of course, it was very important um, income that we could rely on. And I would say that even that agriculture, it was the only one sector of the economy that could back the recession and could uh, show a good results up to the Russian invasion, invasion in 2014. So really we switched to agriculture and we developed a lot uh, in the field of organic agriculture production. And Ukraine was the main, had a manicure of breadbasket of Europe because of organic production as well. And Europe trusted us because they know the good quality of Ukrainian products and what we have now about, as I said, why one sort of power territory is mined. Uh, big area of our lands burn in spells of petroleum products, uh, soil pollution by military waste. And because of that, uh, our farmers every year, they lose uh, up to uh, five uh, after two point point five uh, billion 
euros every year. And of course, we cannot, we cannot miss the emission of substances deposited on the ground. Dollar the emission, they, um, they will lead to underground waters. And if um, surface water, uh, the exchange time is about several months. So underground waters, it takes to exchange, it takes about several years to become normal and um, per water. And here you can see a, a situation with mined areas in Ukraine. Uh, and all mines, they bring a lot of uh, environmental pollutions. And uh, such components, it, like it's not only dangerous for our life, like because of explosions, because uh, all mines, they contain sulfur, nickel, cadmium, titanium, plumbum, and so on, especially sulfur. Uh, when it um, uh, mixed with uh, precipitation, it turns to sulfur, uh, so to um, sulfur acid, and it uh, burns all the life components in the soil. So the soil become unfertile. And here you can see that a large area of uh, land has become unsuitable. Not only only for agriculture, but only also for living. And um, now, if you can, if we um, if you can see the um, images from drones or geospatial images, we uh, we can find a lot of uh, trenches, a lot of craters. They have to buy missile, artillery, uh, drones, and so on. And uh, real pictures that were sent me by my colleagues. From Suma National Agraria University. Just it's a, just a small example, just very small craters, but um, now we have a lot of such craters in Ukraine. And also, we had a lot of problems with uh, soils polluted by oils. And in soils impregnated with fuel and lubricants, uh, water permeability decreases. Oxygen is displaced. Biochemical and microbiological processes are disrupted. The water air regime and the circulation of nutrients deteriorated. The root, root nutrition of plants is disturbed. Plants growth and development are um, inhibited. The carbon dioxide absorption values is decreasing and all this can come to death of plants. So it also, uh, we also have a risk that some parts of our lands will become like deserts. Uh, and this real picture that I saw in the, uh, when I saw the internet, it's like it's close to Kiev, uh, where one woman decided that all the emanation that, that brings nothing to her soil, but it's very dangerous actually, because this emanation uh, during to erosion, uh, it can bring titanium, strontium, nickel, cadmium, lithium, and all it. If this uh, all metals will turn into mobile forms, they will be absorbed by plants, and um, they, due to food chains, they will come to our organism. With uh, numbers about financial losses of our agriculture. And uh, it is estimated that the total sum to for our uh, agriculture recovery totaled at about 17 billion of euros. And uh, now, together with Royal Agriculture and Agriculture Team, uh, we launched a project about assessment of damages at Ukrainian lands. And we, um, firstly, we choose three regions uh, Chernigov. Sumo and Kharkiv oblasts, but then uh, when the um, uh, explosion on Kahoka Dam happened, we also decided to include Kherson region in our project. And we took uh, the main, I would, uh, I would like to tell you about the main idea of our project. That's our partners, so you can see. It's not only from academic community, but also from business, from uh, geospatial uh, companies. 
so firstly, we developed a protocol uh, for soil sampling. Uh, because it's very important to understand to how to take the soil samples to get the uh, adequate results of soil sampling. And we developed it together with Israel Agriculture University, we developed a protocol and tested the Salisbury Plain. It's an event we used PCRF, gas mat, we used, uh, used UAV, we used spatial data uh, to calibrate all this data. Because you all understand that some territories of Ukraine they are not accessible now. They are mined, they are under occupation now. But now we have already um, think about uh, how can we remediate these lands? And how can we estimate the scale of the disaster? Of course, it is why we can take the, all the tools that um, have been already occupied, such farmlands, and to predict what is going on there, taking into account the size of uh, trenches, quarters that we have, and by using your spatial data to uh, predict the situation of the paid territories, to be ready when the, all the territory of Ukraine will be liberated to uh, start with remediation and revitalizing of that plan. So, uh, first of all, we took 20 cell samples by using our protocol from these three regions, Kharkiv, Chernikiv, and Sumoblast, and we uh, brought this, it's, it's my colleagues, you know, exactly the process, showcase of uh, taking soil samples. And they uh, took soil samples here in Switzerland. Uh, and last spring, we organized the like, workshop where my colleagues from ETH, from Bernfach Hochschule, from uh, Royal Agriculture University, and my uh, colleagues from Ukraine, Sumo National Agrarian University, were presented. And they brought the soil samples and we shared it with all, between all the partners and all partners by using different methods, they analyzed the soil samples to understand what kind of contamination we have, how can we uh, develop the strategy, how can we uh, make this challenge. And uh, uh, then the next step, we requested our partner, uh, Pixel is a uh, company that uh, has their own satellites and we requested them about getting uh, geospatial images with a resolution about up to 10 meters. And then we can calibrate data obtained by uh, uh, collecting ground truth data and geospatial data. Unfortunately, it was. Um, uh, uh, it was written in our process that we should uh, take uh, some images from uh, UAV, but it's impossible now in Ukraine because using all UAV, especially in the rural zones that are very close to Russia, borders, it's, it's forbidden. But at least we can use uh, ground truth data and geospatial data. And all these data we are going to collect in special app that uh, was developed fast. Designed files by Aru. It's an industrial company in England. So we also think that this information can be collected here. It's like now it's like a pilot project, but in the future we expect that a lot of experts, a lot of research institutions, departments uh, of um, different communities will use this app to collect exact information for the cultural sector. And uh, then, as the next step of our project, we will estimate what kind of pollution we have, what scale of pollution we have. Fortunately, uh, the uh, soils in previously occupied Sumich, Rinke, and Hard Problems, they, are not, they, they don't contain very huge amount of heavy metals and big concentrations. So, yeah, it's sometimes, it's, for example, we, um, uh, we have found high concentration of titanium, um, uh, cuprum, uh, uh, antimonium, uh, and some other components, but they are not so high as we could predict. But for other territories, for example, in the Kherson region, we understand that the situation will be much worse. And for them, we'll, we will uh, offer two strategies. First, it's remediation of the sense, 
But uh, experts say that if remediation um, takes more than 10 years, it's much better to withdraw this oil sample with uh, this fragments and uh, conservation issues to biodiversity and to turn the soils to like metals to keep biodiversity. And uh, so on the second stage, we're going to, to give recommendation to our farmers so to do the same. Uh, and, but we do understand that the territory of Ukraine is huge. And I would assure you that when the war ends, a lot of investors will come to Ukraine and they will they would like to invest money to our soils. This is fertile soils. And we do understand that they will need people who can advise them what to do with the soil, how to remediate the soils, how much money they should invest in the soils to it to become a normal soil, fertile soil. And our uh, next step. We will put all our research um, fundings into study program, training program for future experts. So we have uh, the, here, you can see the upper uh, right corner. Uh, you can see our advertise, advertise, advertisement that we have already launched. So we're going to combine like two projects, like research project, humanitarian project. Uh, we're going to invite former soldiers, probably with disabilities, Veterans who got back from their battlefield and who doesn't know how to apply their knowledge. Probably they launched drones. Probably in the normal before war life, they have they were agronomist or environmentalist or some someone also attached to this speciality. And we we are going to teach them how to become cell experts because a lot of such kind of access will be demanded in Ukraine. And we uh, have a degree with, uh, with, uh, with this common project with World Agriculture University. We are going to teach up to 20, 24 uh, former soldiers. And uh, we will start in the middle of November. And some professors from Cambridge, from World Agriculture University, from TH, they have already agreed to contribute to this research. And some of them even will stay pleased to come to Ukraine, to the summer region. So uh, we have developed a program, four weeks program for such experts. And we, uh, so if you want, if you know someone who would like, who would be interested in this program, please share this information. It's open in my um, social web pages and you can share this, it's the old contacts me directly to ask about this opportunity. So it's a complex project even two projects that we start with understanding the scale of the project, the, of the problem. We try to find solutions and we try to feel, uh, to find the people who will help us to solve this problem. And probably this is this our first participants. It can be like a training for trainers. They also can scale up our project to develop um, more trainings for uh, people who would like to get this knowledge. And um, also we have a, a big problem with marine pollution because um, since the February 2024, uh, a lot of uh, warships of Russia, they have been blockading our um, merchant ships and they uh, attack our coastal areas, coastal, you know, coastal um, refinery stations, um, our tanks with fuels, and um, they pollute our uh, aquifers with oils, with uh, dischargers, waters, because no one can, can control them. And the second problem is it creates uh, death of dolphins, and uh, international environmental organizations, they have already fixed, recorded about 3,000 of deaths of dolphins. Uh, the coastal rest was, you know, the same part of the like, sea. And if, they, if we consider all the basin of Black Sea, so we can say about 50,000 cases that were reported of deaths of dolphins. At five times more than the pre war, war time. The next uh, next slide you can see uh, uh, 
all skills because of um, attacks, of Russia warships, now uh, uh, tankers uh, with oils, and uh, some, you know, that uh, oil uh, is very, very, very dangerous for uh, marine bioorganisms because oil uh, um, can build a very, very uh, thick film and prevent passage of oxygen. And that is why all the organisms that just can die because they don't have access. And this oil spills it, they cover uh, 100 kilometers, square kilometers now what you see. And of course I cannot not mention, uh, I would say probably one of the biggest environmental catastrophes that happen in, not only in Ukraine, but in Europe, in Europe, in the European continent the destruction of uh, the whole Kadem. So it's just because of the destruction, the water was polluted with fuels, lubricants, fertilizers. Uh, it caused the decrease in salinity. Uh, and you know that some organisms that are very sensitive to salinity, sea salinity. And it of course caused a lot of deaths of um, sea microorganisms. And, uh, Increase of toxicity in the seawater with an ultra high nitrogen concentration led to the death of some hydrobions in shallow waters. And uh, because of mass development of phytoplankton, about 70% of coastal areas were covered uh, with um, substances that also prevented uh, passage of oxygen. And before the war, we had a problem with our um, nature reservoirs. If compared with European countries, we had three times less uh, reservoirs in the territory of Ukraine and two times less uh, areas covered by forests. So it's, if not uh, average, um, in average for Europe, it's about 30% of territory covered by Forest, but in Ukraine we had only 16%. And I cannot predict even what situation we will uh, get after the war because timber is very important for military and so on. But now um, about 3 million of hectares of emerald network is, uh, is located in the risk zone. About seven, uh, 600 thousand of hectare of our areas that um, included in the Ramsar sites under uh, attack. And can you imagine these Ramsar sites that, that contain unique, unique plants, unique elements of our biodiversity? And they are under risk of uh, extinction. And uh, as I have said, about 20% of our territories uh, of national res reservoirs, they uh, were occupied. It's two biosphere reserves, eight nature reserves, and 10 national natural parks. Three million hectares of forests now covered by war auctions. 23, uh, more than 23,000 hectares of forests burned, have already been burned. And about uh, 80 animal species are threatened with extinction. So, uh, probably you have been bored with all these numbers, but these numbers and numbers matter because all these numbers, it will help us to bring all the uh, cases of environmental damages. But, and uh, by the way, we have already collected, our government and civil society, they have already collected about 2,500 different cases of environmental damages. They are going to bring it to international court. But it's very important to know all the method, to have the, these developing methodologies, how to re re uh, fix, how to record all these damages. Because it's not the first um, case when Ukraine will uh, apply to international court about operation. Um, uh, when um, after the Gulf War, uh, Saudi Arabia got only 6.5% of 
of all required reparations because they couldn't prove, couldn't confirm all the environmental damages committed. So this is why now it's very important for our country to uh, properly assess all these numbers, problems, all the damages, in order then to request reparations. And of course, uh, the main idea of that using the preparation is to green, uh, to green, rebuild Ukraine uh, in a better way, in a greener way, uh, with uh, sustainable and sustainable green solutions, with uh, involvement of all the society into these processes, with uh, usage of all uh, available technologies. And now I'm very pleased and happy to be a part of the proper project. To build Ukraine, it's a project that helps to transfer technologies from Switzerland to Ukraine. So we teach Ukrainian women, Ukrainian refugees, the best technologies that you have in Switzerland is in their energy sector and manufacturing and so on to uh, transfer these technologies to Ukraine. So the very building of Ukraine in a better way to become, to create a better future for our next generation in Ukraine. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you're welcome. Please, Thank you. Elena, you sold your quote take for um, um, actually data collection on land in order to prepare proper measures for land. And how many people are now involved in this project? And what, what do you think? How will it go ahead? I and mean, how many volunteers do we? Estimate will contribute to this project in the next year. Yes, thank you for the question, Miriam. It's really very important to know as much as many people as we can. So now we have about uh, 15 researchers actually involved in the project. But uh, when we develop this project, a new project about teaching of future experts, so now I have been contacted to different organizations like on broken. It's a big organization that are dealing with veterans, uh, soldiers with disabilities, and other veterans organizations in each region of Ukraine. We are trying to share this information that we have launched this project. We are trying to involve all of them. And today I send information to our Minister of Agriculture uh, and to Minister of Environment Protection. To, they also should uh, know about this project. And so as many people, would like to join our project, the better. And also, I would say that we have already got um, yeah, like like-minded people from Cambridge University, and they're going together with us to launch another branch of our project. So together, we have uh, planned a mission to Kherson region. So um, in uh, at the beginning of November, they're going to go to Kherson to take the soil samples. Uh, the special method because they are exactly interested in um, radioactive elements con that contaminated our soil. So they will take soil samples by their specific methods, and then they will come to uh, uh, Suma National Agrarian University. They will um, firstly they will uh, detect by bacteria of some uh, heavy metals in the soil samples. The second, they also will participate in person in that program for. Uh, future soil experts. So it's very actually it was very nice when um, in September, the beginning of September, I visited the, the UK and uh, I was interviewed by BBC. And after that interview, I got so many calls, so many people said, "No, no, no!" The call they contacted me and said, "Okay, so you are so cool. Is it the project that you launched? Let's. How can I help you?" And I was. Uh, not just by colleagues from academic community, but from business, from uh, like startups. People also would like to contribute to this project. They don't want money. They just have an idea. How can we help? What can we do? We have this expertise. We have this knowledge. We have this um, this financial even resources. How? What can we help?
kan. Thank you for making this question goes. Are you uh, supported by other government or ministry of agriculture or ecology of Ukraine? And maybe you have a roadmap already if you would love to enroll in it. What would you like? Right? When you think about stuff, what will be the next step? And what will maybe you need for the next step? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yeah, actually, I'm here uh, because I'm supported by the program for cities. And, uh, you know, here I've launched two, two projects. One of my projects was climate policy, about energy security, and about a model of energy system for Ukraine. And another project that's appeared just like because uh, it was requested by my colleagues from Ukraine. So I'm not a great total expert. Yes, I have my, in my background, I have. Uh, the question regarding ecological safety, uh, but uh, it's actually a very important topic now, so I decided to care. I will put my best on it now. Um, so is supported by um, British government, which is the British Academy, and the XTX markets, it's like called philanthropy, so they support us. And um, they have got some money from. Uh, um, like Bonford Trust and LSM uh, company. So uh, also have a lot of ideas uh, for new projects and probably you know that now the project between uh, Swiss National Foundation, uh, Swiss um, uh, Science Foundation and SNSF, Swiss National Science Foundation and um, National Fund of Science of Ukraine will be launched. So we also have an idea to apply for this project uh, because uh, we would like to uh, to launch a new project for Kherson region for agriculture, for uh, remediation of uh, so, uh, farmlands and agriculture. And we also applied for Canadian project. Uh, it's exactly also um, around remediation issues uh, for Kherson region. We have a lot of ideas. Maybe you explain a bit. What you showed is extremely broad. Um, so it's an enormous amount uh, on multiple uh, levels. So um, how do you uh, operate, navigate it? Are you more uh, generally coordinating or are you focusing on certain things? Yeah, okay, thank you for the question. So today my aim was just to explain all the broad ex extent of all these environmental damages. So, but uh, I mostly uh, concentrated on soil pollution and uh, a bit on uh, climate, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and so on. So uh, the main product is exactly soils. And I'd like to add a couple of issues about the previous question. To the previous question, so uh, that app is that I've told you. We are going to use to collect all the information to make it more concentrated, and then uh, we're going to use this app um, and to invite uh, different different researchers from around the world who would like to contribute. And for example, uh, if you have a prominent researcher in soil remediation in China, in America, or somewhere, and if you have farmers who would like to request this help, so they can set their request that app. And someone from around the world who have uh, expertise that feeds this project, they can say, okay, we can contribute with our knowledge and spirit, and we can advise you how to remediate this land without coming to Ukraine even. Because all the information, ground truth data, spatial data, will be set up on that app. Mm -hmm. So it will help like, to chapterize our project. Any more questions, comments, suggestions? X to me. This can be artillery used, this can be used, this cannot be not can be used, or from the soil can be used in the uh, first of all, it's a uh, uh, very good question. Now, the development, not just methodology, but just a bit protocol uh, for soil sampling. 
It's how, and uh, the first our idea, we developed it with rural agriculture university. Then when we um, took it about more than 200 soil samples, we understood that our methodology was a bit mistake. It's mis it contained some mistakes. And then we adjusted it. We understood that not all pollutions are contained in exactly in craters. And we should find pollutions 20, 30 meters because of explosions. And uh, then we adjusted this methodology and we are going to share it with our Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment Protection to like, like our uh, contribution and probably our methodology will, can be used by other research institutions. Because this protocol we uh, developed together with uh, Kharkiv Institute, who is uh, Institute for Soil Protection, who is a responsible body in Ukraine, appointed by government. This is so, uh, it's, like, it's kind of like you, uh, a united protocol that can be used for uh, any organizations. But now we are looking for approval from government, and then it can be shared. And it's about um, uh, dividing soils for different uh, zones, so like zone for is it for mediation, zone for conservation. Uh, we will use another methodology that is developed by another research. So uh, we will uh, get there uh, like rock. Like for example, people um, research says that if uh, you estimate that this land cannot be remediated uh, during ten years, so it should it is better to withdraw this land and for the biodiversity purposes. So we also will use all this their recommendation for it. And of course, there are some recommendations developed by our ministry which territories should be withdrawn, which territories can be remediated. Yeah, thank you very much for your really amazing presentation. And I think that your other project is uh, absolutely uh, valuable and in time for uh, Ukraine. So my question consists of two parts. First one, um, are you in touch with some other initiatives on uh, agriculture uh, radiation after war? And the second one, uh, do you have one support of the Ukrainian government or interest of Ukrainian government to be in touch with you and give the program and your results? Uh, the second question is a very interesting question because now we have a big problem in Ukraine. We have a lot of research institutions, we have government supporters that are trying to do comes from their own. So they, uh, they, they don't want to unite their efforts. They preferred, okay, we have this, for example, um, uh, one institute in Kharkiv, they have about 60 uh, monitoring states, but they prefer to keep in secret some information, probably because they cannot just tell them information. But the, my idea and uh, all what I'm trying to do is to unite all efforts. I'm trying to contact as many people that can be interested in our projects as I can. I'm trying to reach uh, our ministry. Uh, so many times I sent them letters. I tried to to explain, and I had several conversations with the representative of our Ministry of Environment Protection. But uh, for now they have a big problem. Problem is human resources that are not enough to cover all the environmental problems. So they say, yeah, it's quite, it's up to date. It's very interesting for us. But uh, how can we help you? What can we do for you? What's it? So we're trying to develop this mechanism. Um, because we understand that uh, we do need this direct communication with ministry. And we need, do need their help. We don't ask about money. We don't ask about like uh, people who can contribute. We ask about their um, uh, like authority. That they can sh to help us to share information. They can, for example, it's quite important that we uh, don't just uh, take this expert, teach them and uh, say, okay, now, goodbye, you can go whenever you want. It's very important that this all future experts would be connected to our ministry, that they would be in the list, because you know that uh, now our Ministry of Agriculture is very busy with, dealing with, with developing strategy for land remediation. So now, if you have these experts taught by prominent universities, uh, the Cambridge, Teach, and so on, so why not to use their expertise? The time to to reach them, to explain what we are doing. But you know, there are 
I cannot blame them because there are a lot of institutions and geos and so on that are trying to do the same. So probably uh, one day our town will come and then we will cooperate together. <laughs> the first question was, are the initiatives? Uh, yeah, it's like a, a, the future. It's a, um, for example, uh, we cooperate with other uh, organization like the Peace Coalition, they help us to share information, they help us to find appropriate partners, they help us to find financial resources. For example, with their help now we applied for small scale projects supported by the UK. And um, yeah, it's, it's quite good to have such different kinds of cooperation and Swiss network for Ukraine is also a kind of share information. It's very nice to have this community of Swiss Ukrainian people and I'm happy to be a part of this uh, Swiss network. So yes, we are quite open for any cooperation. Yeah, I have a question uh, about CO2 emission and some future perspective on this, because you mentioned during your talk that you have uh, you have worked on some scenarios about atom energy, about renewable energy, etc. And you also mentioned this green economy. But are there any potential issues, potential points set by EU or international organizations when Ukraine started? Um, when Ukraine will start recovery or building infrastructure, do you see any problems that Ukraine potentially may meet? Um, we see two emission with these problems. A lot of emissions will, uh, will be caused uh, not by this new interaction, but it's the construction processes. Exactly, we will need a lot of construction products uh, and so on, and it will cause like even double in, uh, amount of emissions. And uh, we uh, do understand that we are also now trying to choose exactly right way for our um, future energy sector because uh, you know that in European Union some countries decided to adapt to power generation for the world they decided that then they now they see what to do with it and now in Ukraine we see the situations that nuclear power station are quite dangerous uh, and like for you know that the territory of uh, Zaporizhia is the biggest nuclear power station in Europe. The, the Zaporizhia has been occupied for more than one year. It's a big danger. And uh, Russia, all the time, they try to trade with this situation, trying to treat us. And uh, our government has scenario of decentralization of energy generation. And one of the scenarios is creating um, some modular power, nuclear power stations that can be located in different regions of Ukraine. So now we are trying to involve in our uh, like modeling this uh, scenario uh, uh, and to, to uh, assess cost effectiveness of this scenario. And another scenario that, that relies just on renewables because um, so we are talking about uh, offshore and uh, onshore energy power station. They are uh, uh, not so easy target for uh, drones, for missile attacks, as like, like nuclear power station. So it's very important for us to um, to stop these renewables instead of building, as it was during the Soviet Union times, this big nuclear power station or rely on coal. We need to refuse coal generation and we need to refuse and to switch to carbon neutrality. Have I answered? Any more questions? Suggestions? Probably someone would like to contribute to cooperate. Uh, feels that he or she has much experience. <laughs>